I can tell by these, uh, by the slides here in the background, this is going to be a very exciting talk. So I'm Greg Washington. I'm Dean of Engineering here at the Henry Sam Whaley School of Engineering. And I want to welcome you to, a ne to our next installment of our Dean's Distinguished Lecture. Today we're going to have a tag team uh, lecture. I think it's our first tag team lecture of the series, uh, actually, to be honest with you. So this is a first. Uh, I don't know who's going first or second, so I'm going to take a guess. So, okay, so this is good. So Lewis is going first. And so first up we'll have uh, uh, Lewis Ussolini, Uccellini. Uh, who is the uh, National, Oceanic, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administra Administration's Assistant Administrator for Weather Services and the Director of the National Weather Service. In this role, he is responsible for the day-to-day -day, uh, civilian weather operations for the United States, its territories, adjacent waters, and ocean areas. Uh, Ushalini received his PhD, master's, and bachelor of science uh, degrees in meteorology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So he's a proud badger since he got all of his three degrees from there. Uh, also, we will have uh, Don Klein. Don Klein is the chief, uh, is the chief of the hydrology laboratory uh, for NOAA's National Weather Service. He was formerly the director of the National Weather Service's uh, National Operational Hyd Hyd Hydrologic Remote Sensing Center. He received his BA, MA, and PhD degrees in geography from the University of Colorado. And so he is a proud buffalo. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> and so, <laughs> yes, how to be a proud buffalo these days, I understand. <laughs> But it's a little bit easier to be a proud badger. Uh, but we, we rarely get individuals of this stature to give us an overview of uh, what's happening in, the, in, 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 in climate in our, in our country and, and, and in the globe in general. And so without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Louis Ushalini first. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, I'm delighted to be here. And like I told the first group of, of students uh, working with Sarouche that um, um, I, I try, one of my, one of my uh, goals uh, is to try to learn something new every day. And uh, today I certainly met the quota, I think for the next two months. Um, it's been tremendous uh, interacting with you um, and getting a better understanding of the breadth of work that's going on here. Um, what I want to do is um, uh, provide a strategic basis for moving the Weather Service forward and, um, and, and give you some examples of where we are in terms of the, the typical weather features. Uh, we'll do a hurricane, we'll do a severe weather. And then I want to uh, set the stage for how uh, we're building our capacity and capabilities in the water aspects, uh, not only working within the Weather Service, but uh, reaching across NOAA um, and uh, the larger research uh, enterprise. So this building Weather Ready Nation is our strategic outcome. Uh, it's, it's been reviewed um, by the National Academy of Public Administration and said it was one of the best well-posed strategic outcomes they've ever seen come out of a government agency. And then they pointed the finger at us and said, you can't do it alone. And as you can see, as you'll see, we've gotten this tremendous um, embrace of it by the larger uh, community, um, uh, students through um, uh, private sector folks who uh, work with us, and um, especially the emergency management community. So it's uh, it's really taken off. And the idea here is is to link our forecast watches and warnings uh, to decision makers in a way that we get the proper outcome. Uh, people saving people's lives, uh, mitigating property loss, to build up a resiliency in this country to especially the increasing extreme events, and, and, and in the course of that, to build this weather-ready nation. So uh, what I want to speak to is the increased vulnerability to natural disasters, uh, and this is the basis uh, for the urgency of uh, 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 building this 
weather ready nation of the challenges for impact based decision support services um, and how we're reaching out to the social science community uh, to address those challenges uh, taking uh, prediction uh, to the next level show you some examples and then ongoing advances and it will end here with student opportunities so uh, this is a chart from the um, the uh, uh, Munich reinsurance it shows a general increase in these uh, loss events, total number of loss events, which can be measured either by loss of lives or the, uh, the uh, money loss associated with those events. Um, and it's broken up into categories, the green here being meteorological, uh, hydrological, climate, with climate being mostly drought related. Um, so you see this general increase here. The insurance industry obviously recognizes that they're, um, they're paying out more money, okay, uh, with respect to extreme events. So there are, there are many factors which contribute to this. Increasing population, uh, increasing population living in vulnerable areas like along the coast, in fire areas, um, in the middle of the country in Tornado Alley, okay. Um, so that's happening. There's more infrastructure at risk. There are signs of climate change which play right into this. We're seeing signs of more extreme rainfall events. Uh, sea level rise is certainly playing a role in the uh, coastal flooding that's associated with events. Um, so we have this ongoing churn uh, where, where um, um, you know, we're just dealing with more people in more vulnerable areas. At the same time, we've improved forecasts of extreme events four to eight days in advance. And I'll show you why this particular advancement is important to moving forward. So we need to take these forecasts to the next level for effective decision support. And this is a principal driver uh, for our strategic goal. So, so what we're emphasizing here is to, uh, in terms of becoming a weather ready nation is about building community resiliency in the face of this increasing vulnerability to extreme weather. Uh, to be ready, responsive, and resilient. So ready and responsive is, is a function of us making better forecasts and warnings. Resilient is that we're communicating those in such a way that people are taking the right action that less people die and more property is saved, okay? Um, so this requires us to have a fully integrated field structure with better forecasts and warnings. We're being told over and over again that consistency is a key factor in providing forecast information days in advance that people will actually take advantage of. So people will shop around and if they see inconsistent forecasts and warnings in the extended time frame, they won't take any action, all right? So consistency, it's not just accuracy, all right? Um, we want to provide actionable environmental intelligence. Uh, this drives us into this impact-based decision support services. Our, our job doesn't end with just making a forecast how do we work with the decision makers that are actually evacuating people, as an example, or pre-positioning assets? Uh, we deliver through multiple and reliable dissemination pathways, and we work with partners to gain needed response. So the Hurricane Center will tell you that their busiest season is the off season, because that's when they're doing all of this, okay? So it takes a tremendous amount of outreach and training to do that right. Uh, we have established this Weather Ready Nation ambassadors. Uh, these are groups, these are not individuals. We have over 1,570. Uh, they uh, work with us, they share best practices, um, and as you can see in the range of decision makers that we're working with, this is an extremely important part of getting, getting the feedback from our users and partners and customers uh, in terms of the types of messaging that we're doing. Um, these are the strategic goals that we've built in our strategic plan to drive us towards this strategic outcome. So improve weather, uh, weather impact-based decision support services. This is a big deal for our workforce. Uh, this is getting them out of their comfort zone, I, like I said, of just doing meteorology. Uh, improve weather forecasting for the total water prediction, and Don will, will get more into that. Enhance climate services and adapt to climate-related risks. So it's clear that in mapping these together that we have to have a more interdisciplinary collaborative approach uh, to attain this strategic outcome. We just can't hide in our comfort zones of weather, climate, and water and expect to move the whole enterprise forward. 
improve sector relevant information in support of economic productivity. We have a very vigorous private sector in this country that we wholesale our data to, and we have to continue to do that. This is like the big data initiative that we just announced at the department level. Enable environmental forecast services. This is not to us to do it, but to provide the, uh, the um, infrastructure, the model capabilities, uh, the dissemination capabilities for our partners in NOAA, for example, National Ocean Service, to do ecological forecast systems and to get it out in real time and interact with users. I have the uh, Lake Erie event at Toledo, the half a million people that woke up and didn't have any water to drink and, and couldn't be told, they couldn't tell them when that fresh water would come back that would be drinkable and touchable, by the way, couldn't touch this water. Um, this is a seminal event. You know, half a million people wake up and they, they don't have any drinking water. So we'll get back to that uh, at the end of this talk. And then sustain a highly skilled professional workforce. We broke this out as a separate goal because we want students coming in, we want to train our workforce that's already there to fit into this interdisciplinary mold and be comfortable providing impact-based decision support services. This means that we're actually now working into the social science arena as well. So uh, the challenges. Um, this was one of my education periods. I, I actually um, um, was struck in 2011 by how well we did in our forecast and warnings for severe weather events, and yet 500 people lost their lives. And we did a lot of soul searching. We had this national conversation meeting in Oklahoma with a bunch of people coming in from all different aspects of physical science that we always felt comfortable working with and a large contingent of social scientists. So we have to start thinking in terms of what is the, you know, what is the spectrum of IDSS, the Impact-Based Decision Support Services. As you observe, forecast, warn, communicate, and respond, there are decisions that are made based on observations, much less what happens once you get into the forecast and warning mode. So you have to sustain a situational awareness during a long event, like let's think of the Texas flooding situation that occurred over a five, six, seven day period, how you, ma how you manage your observations and how you communicate them is just as important as how you're communicating your forecasts and warnings. You have to create, you have to relate and connect meteorological predictions to key decision points. So there are multiple questions and issues on how to sustain, relate, and connect to ensure desired outcomes. And our big mistake was we thought we, would, we knew how to do this from a meteorological point of view. And then we find out in 2011, we didn't have a clue, all right, even in our watches and warnings on how to properly connect. I'll give you an example. We extend a, a, a warning for a tornado out to 45 minutes. We thought people would shelter in place for 45 minutes. That's the last thing they did. They get in their car and they try to drive away, or if their family's over there and they're here, they're getting in their car and they're going over there, right? Because they, they can do best for their family. The worst place to be in a tornado outbreak is in your car, right? So we, there's big disconnects here, folks, even in areas that we think we know, we have a real good background in and know what we're doing. So this was my learning experience on this Sunday, uh, June 8th, 2014. I'm with my wife, I'm on a ferry across the, uh, crossing the, um, the Delaware Bay from Lewis to uh, Cape May, and I just happened to read this, uh, you know, the Sunday uh, review, and I come across this, and it was all, um, you know, focused on this biology of risk as it related to economics, right? But I got to this, and, you know, first of all, they're talking about these stable traits, and they were trying to relate, why do people always ride the stock market down to the, to the crater? and then sell, right? They just, you know, they don't assess their risk in real time properly, essentially. So he talks about this, humans are designed with shifting risk preferences. They were an integral part of our response to the stress or challenges, stress. You want a stressful situation? Think of a tornado heading towards your town and you got 20 minutes to make a decision on what you're going to do. So all of a sudden, it, this, this phrase really hit me. So the shifting risk preferences poses enormous challenges for linking predictions to IDSs. And then I listened to a talk by William Wattell of Paul County, Georgia, really unassuming local emergency manager, crystallized 
organize, you know, the spectrum of decision making, organize government agencies. This is what we do. And we feel very comfortable in doing that. Then you have these loosely coupled social and religious organizations as an example. They have their own phone tree, you know? How do you connect? And then you have this personal, organic one, the cell phone. A person with a cell phone is a decision maker, and they will shop around. They very, if, if they can't manage it in real time, they give it to their kids, and they manage it in real time for them, okay? So this is, this is important. That spectrum on top of the, of the risk um, uh, assessment of risk is just, just an amazing uh, combination that gets us into, so we have multiple dissemination, multiple choices that do not lend itself to consistent messaging. So the recognition of and response to the risk are a function of the decision maker, the extent to which they have a plan, the extent to which the plan suits their risk management, and addresses sh uh, shifting risk preferences. To me, this is what we have to come to grips with, and as a physical scientist, we're not, we're not tooled up to do this, okay? So, our reach out to the social science community now since 2011 is the real deal. And it's not just for tornadoes and hurricanes and that kind of thing. It's for floods, as we saw uh, down in Texas. So in terms of take, let me give you an example of how this plays out then. So we have a landfalling hurricane example. FEMA does not evacuate people. FEMA organizes a, a, a federal regional, state, local plan of attack prior to, during, and then after a hurricane event, for example, in this example. They're pre-positioning assets in days five, four, and three. So they, they have contracts with Lowe's and Home Depot, you know, stock up with, with plywood, you know, or stock up with uh, generators because we're going to need generators or we're going to be a lot of electricity out. Those people can do it a lot better than any government agency. So that's what they do. They have to make those decisions here. They need an eight-day, seven-day, six-day, five-day, four-day forecast tick-tock before they'll make that decision. If your forecast is going up and down, it's going to be a storm, it's not going to be a storm, it's going to be a storm, it's not going to be a storm, they can't make that decision at day four. So you have to give them that cone of uncertainty. You have to give them a level of confidence as you approach an event. But that decision is being made right here based entirely on a forecast. So their risk assessment is different than somebody sitting on the coastline that's being told to evacuate now by the state and local emergency managers. They're the ones who manage the evacuation, okay? And that happens right about here. Still a forecast, storm's still out there. They're looking at, they're looking at the weather channel. They're assessing, is this thing gonna come at us? They are even smart enough know to know are they on the south side of the storm or the north side of the storm? That's all happening here. If you wait to day one and ask for assistance and evacuation, it ain't happening. You ain't getting it. Okay, they're not coming after you. So it's all happening here. So you can see where the forecast will, and how somebody assesses their risk here could be a lot different than how they assess it right here. So you have to manage that in the way you message your forecasts and warnings during this period. So the state and local emergency managers need consistent and more accurate forecasts from days three through eight for their evacuation decisions. You don't see that in the public, that we're working, FEMA has a permanent um, representative in the Hurricane Center, and we have all kinds of, of, of connections now to the state and local emergency management community, and there are certain time elements that, that kick in when we have certain products out, and, and that's what they're working towards. So here's uh, Sandy. Um, I'm sorry for being East Coast centric, but you know, this is important. Uh, uh, almost 70 million people affected by this one. And this was a five day forecast. Everybody's arguing about the models and who had the best model. But this is a human forecaster basing a decision at day five based on ensembles, multi model ensembles. And this is a tremendous forecast, and we've never seen this turn back in the, you know, this far north. So this is a very unique. And of course, you have this tremendous fetch that's just driving the water into the New Jersey, uh, Long Island area. So a tremendous forecast. 
So, you know, we pat ourselves on the back for the forecast, but the real action was happening behind the scenes. That, that landfall was on a Monday night. By Thursday, we had to make a decision. Where's the track going to be and whether this thing was going to go extra tropical or not? Because the, uh, the fact is, if we had had a hurricane warning up and then it went extra tropical and we took that hurricane warning out, right, because there's no longer a hurricane, right, everybody's going back. So the emergency matter, you know, you know, the people's minds are, it's not a hurricane. I've, I've gone through nor'easters. I don't have to evacuate my house, right? So our decision was, and, and, and this was driven by our interaction with the FEMA and local emergency management, whatever we decided was going to happen on Thursday, that's what we were going to ride all the way to landfall. And it didn't go extra tropical until Monday. We thought this thing was going to go extra tropical on Friday or Saturday morning, okay? So, and, we, and the idea was, Craig Fugate and I sat down, what are we doing as messaging for this across the board? Unique nature of the storm, the tra expected transition from tropical to extra tropical. We compared it to the perfect storm, which is what the same kind of thing happened in the perfect storm. There was a memory in the Northeast especially of the impact of that. Uh, large area of wind impacts, so that the wind, wind impacts were of tropical storm nature all the way from Cape Cod down to North Carolina, a huge area of wind impacts. Uh, the recurvature of the storm toward New Jersey, um, and then this, this, this drive, this fetch from east to west, which turned out to be about 1,500 uh, kilometers long, um, would drive that water towards New Jersey, New York City area. Record inundation along the East Coast, and we had to deal with a record blizzard. This is the first hurricane that had blizzard statements associated with it in the forecast. There was uh, 30 inches of snow in the Appalachian Mountains with uh, 60 mile an hour winds. Okay, so we had to communicate this starting on Thursday for a landfalling storm on Monday. To me, this was an extraordinary accomplishment, and we did save lives. But there's still 140 lives lost, and the Wharton School has done a review of, of this, and they, they, they showed that it, as much as we talked about inundation um, and the unique nature of the storm and the track, we didn't show the water part of it well enough that everybody they were interviewing along the coast after this event said they were, they were focused on the wind, not the water. And most of the people that died, died due to the water. Okay? So clearly, success in one respect, long way to go in terms of communicating threat. Uh, last year, uh, this was the only landfalling storm we had. It was a Category 2 upon landfall. It was Hurricane Arthur. Uh, this is the, uh, the simulation from the H Wharf. It was the first model. Uh, most of the models were driving this thing out to sea. The H Wharf was bringing it right along the coast. The red and the black is, is the actual track is the black. This was the only area that got evacuated. We had, a, we had a, um, uh, an experimental surge uh, graphics. We were showing graphics now, uh, and the emergency management community said this really helped them. People left. When they saw this, they left. So communicating by words uh, is one thing. When you show them an app, they reacted. The other key thing about this is where they didn't evacuate. They didn't evacuate from here down to Georgia, and they didn't evacuate from here up here. Why is that important? This was the 4th of July weekend the biggest commercial weekend of the East Coast Beach area. So we avoided a multi-million dollar impact, hundreds of millions of dollars probably, by focus, being able to focus the area of evacuation. You can do the same thing for severe weather. Um, it's the same prepositioning assets, state and local emergency managers. The main difference here is, is that the action happens in minutes instead of hours or days. And this is, um, you know, what, what a post-tornado event can look like. Uh, the example I'll show here is 20, uh, now this is 2013 and more. Uh, more uh, Oklahoma seems to get every tornado these days. Um, again, convective outlooks highlighted six days, four days, three days in advance. Uh, the interaction with the emergency management community was full blast during this period uh, with, with a high probability of um, day one tornado probability of 10% over a large area. Uh, they, and, and it's
constant drumbeat leading up to this day. They actually, in some areas, called off school. It was the first time they called off school before the tornado outbreak. Um, one of the interesting stories here, uh, and a successful effort to improve impact-based pollution support, I mentioned the 2011 severe weather season. That was the Doppelin tornado. People didn't really respond to the warning. Over 140 people lost their lives. A hospital took a direct hit. People lost their lives in a hospital that were in the critical care unit that came into the hospital just before the tornado hit it. So that hospital um, uh, provided sort of a test bed for what not to do, lessons learned. This Shane Cohia, the Moore Medical Center director, spent two years with our warning coordination meteorologist, Rick Smith, visiting that hospital, taking the lessons learned, going through drills, practice, practice, practice. This is the hospital in Moore. Took a direct hit by an EF5 tornado. They had everybody off those systems, those life systems, into the emergency center of the hospital six hours before the tornado hit. They had 300 people show up at the front door. They had people stationed to know exactly where to put those people in the safest place in the hospital. Nobody lost their lives in this, okay? So that's the success story. This is what we mean about building a weather-ready nation and building resiliency. Now, this hospital took a direct hit. This was a total loss. Okay? It got knocked down to building a new medical center. So, uh, but nobody lost their lives here. Okay, so uh, where are we going uh, from this, and how are we trying to address the improved forecast? So first of all, you have to have three basic components of a forecast system, operational system. You need global observations. You need a uh, data simulation model slash science. And you need a computer that can run this. And I need two computers because I have to be backed up. I have to run my models at 99.9% .9 reliability. So um, this is our computing capacity um, in teraflops from 2000 on. And it wasn't until this year we actually cracked you know, the 500 mark and we uh, built up to 776 in January. With the Sandy Supplemental and with the Cray computers that are being installed right now, we're going to be the 2.8 petaflop per machine, primary and backup. And the backup is important because that's where we do our research to operations work. Okay? So this is a big deal for us. Um, clearly, you know, we're in a race with the European. This is the new missile race. Okay? Um, uh, Alan Thorpe, I know, is already working to get this bumped up, which is okay, all right? Um, uh, this is um, what we've done so far. So in 2014, that was the HWARF we implemented. We actually, uh, this, um, early this month, uh, in June, we'll implement a two-kilometer version of that. We're also going to upgrade. We're going to increase the resolution of the uh, ensemble systems. The most important uh, implementation that's occurring by the end of the year is we're finally getting to our four-dimensional data assimilation, uh, and it'll be a 4D ENKF system uh, with a high-resolution GFS, um, which we now run out to 10 days um, at 13-kilometer resolution. The high-res rapid refresh uh, was also being upgraded by the end of this year, and we're working with the research community. They're developing a high-res rapid refresh ensemble. The other thing that's going to happen in fiscal year 16 is we're deploying this Wharf Hydro version 1.0 on our operational system. So we're, we're merging our water, centralized water prediction capabilities with our weather uh, prediction capabilities. Um, in terms of a, um, the global observation, uh, there's a lot of data that goes in. We get about 2 billion observations a day. I'm emphasizing the satellite data. I'm practicing from my trip tomorrow to JPL. Uh, with, the, with the work that we do now through the Joint Center for Satellite Data Assimilation, which we instituted in the early 2000s, uh, we not only imp uh, use operational uh, satellite data, but we're uh, now using uh, research data uh, in our uh, operational model stream. And here's what's in development as we spin up that next generation of uh, global modeling with the four-dimensional data assimilation. And this is one of the reasons we're visiting JPL tomorrow, okay, because we're very interested in the SMAP, the soil moisture, active passive. But there's a lot of work going on here that will get us ready for the JPSS, the next generation uh, low Earth orbiting system, and the uh, GOZAR, which will have a 16-channel imager. So um, 
we're very active in this. We're one of the key partners in this joint Center for Satellite Data Assimilation, which involves NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Oh, we lost an A in NOAA. And um, uh, I better not show my boss that. And then DOD, the, the Air Force, and the Navy as well. All right, the other big story here is the National Water Center was opened up uh, with our initial operating capability on May 26th. This is our ribbon cutting ceremony with Senator Shelby, Secretary Pritzker, the Catherine Sullivan is there. Tom Bogdan, representing the university community, is there as well. Um, and this is the, um, you know, uh, the important part here. Uh, in partnership with NWS National Regional Local Office, the NWC coordinates, integrates, and supports consistent water prediction activities from global to local levels. So this is really going to bring a, foco a focus to our water prediction capabilities that we run operationally. And we're just starting, actually the first wave of people that's coming into this side of the building uh, is uh, more research oriented. How many postdocs? 30, 30 postdocs that we brought on board. Um, uh, one of the key things that we'll do is we'll go from this, this uh, really chaotic nature of how we support our river forecast centers to a more organized way of supporting the river forecast centers. Do centrally what, what's best to do centrally uh, do in a distributed mode that's best doing it distributed mode, I including and especially that regional to local um, um, uh, impact-based decision support services. Now, uh, I'll do a run through. Uh, we're also, you know, we're really focusing on prediction capabilities to uh, uh, connecting them to society needs over a large area. We have responsibilities for the space weather prediction uh, I've just mentioned water, how much, how little, quality, uh, and now health is becoming a big thing that the health uh, community is talking about how do we predict uh, uh, these disease vectors for malaria, uh, cholera, dengue fever. Uh, they got to get ahead of the curve. And there are all ways of predicting these because they have relationships to climate and weather uh, aspects. With space weather, uh, real quick, uh, coronal mass ejections, uh, we uh, can't predict those, but once they happen, we got now have models running derived from the research community um, that allow us to give a three to four days uh, forecast on whether that coronal mass ejection will hit the ionosphere or not. Now, 30 years ago, you probably wouldn't care unless you were in the Navy tracking subs somewhere, okay? But now, your cell phone, your GPS, um, your airlines uh, industry, this is all, uh, you know, all dependent. They get space weather forecasts just like, you know, people get their, uh, you know, coastal forecasts here or, or uh, terrestrial weather. So that's becoming a big, big deal for us. I mentioned this, this event in um, Lake Erie. There's a tremendous amount of work going on in the Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab. They're working with our forecast offices to get experimental models out in real time for the, um, uh, for the freshwater arena. What's really interesting um, here is, is that we have capacity or capabilities to predict um, precipitation forecasts, soil moisture runoff, water temperature forecasts, air temperature forecasts. If we bring those together, uh, we can have harmful algae bloom, hypoxia vibrio. We can actually, we're experimenting with beach quality forecasts right now. Why, why do you want to find out that your kids were swimming in water that they shouldn't have been? when they got that earache two days after being at the beach, right? We, should, we can do this in advance, and this is what it's going to come down to, are the health vectors. So um, this is all happening now. It's happening on our watch, and we're enabling it to happen because we've got that real-time infrastructure that allows this work to get done and get it out to society faster than practically any, anything else that you could think of. Uh, an example of that is NOS working with us. Uh, they run their models now on our operational supercomputer for various bays around the country, including the Columbia River system in San Francisco. Uh, they are experimenting uh, with uh, uh, HAB, Hypoxia Vibrio, which is derived on their bay models by the NOAA Ecological Forecast Team, and they have a test run for Tampa where they actually distribute through the WFO, our forecast office, and they're reaching all of our users plus more. So what they, they tracked when they were trying to do this out of the lab was they're hardly reaching anybody. As soon as they mapped it in through our forecast offices, the, you know, I'm old-fashioned, the phone was ringing off the hook, okay? There were users coming out 
that people weren't even aware of, especially when they started with the video forecast. So um, our infrastructure now is facilitating a much more accelerated distribution of these types of products and services. Okay, student opportunities. Uh, the Holling Scholarship, I think most uh, students know about that. Um, they, you get to choose where you want to be once you, if you win this within NOAA. Many people choose to come into the Weather Service. And um, uh, so we want to make sure that uh, you're aware of that, especially as we work our way uh, and accelerate and enhance our water prediction capabilities. The meteorological intern positions are, uh, are an entry level uh, position within all of our forecast offices. Many, most of the applicants now have uh, master's degrees. I tell the folks who are working towards a bachelor's degree and want to get into the weather service, you better start thinking about a master's degree. Um, there's a pathways program that brings people in while they're in school, and it gets some face time in our forecast offices. And then these postdoc opportunities um, and some are quasi, got it, opportunities at the National Water Center. Uh, this, is, this is a big deal for us, and we're just spinning this up, and Don will speak more to that. Um, I'll just tell you there's a lot of work that's gone on in terms of this uh, pathways program. We had to go through a lot of legal hoops uh, to get it going. But so far, it's, got, it's now working. We got 40 selected, 14 in, in process, and not yet announced are the IT specialists that we're working towards 13. We'll probably do that at the front end of the next fiscal year. Um, so in summary, uh, we are making progress uh, in this impact-based uh, decision support services but we need a better understanding of the human factors. So uh, the real deal here, here is, is that we're bringing social science in, we're bringing social scientists in, and uh, this isn't the first thing that's gonna get cut anymore, okay? I mean, we really need to do this uh, if we're gonna build this, uh, um, this impact-based decision support services across everything we do. I think the weather enterprise is poised to take prediction to other fields for societal impact, water, agriculture, energy, health, um, I remember when I was a student, uh, we were a joke, all right? As a science, we were an art. We weren't a science because we had prediction uh, embedded in us. Um, so uh, now, you know, people are saying, how do you do that? And how do we make it work across these other areas? Uh, we're advancing our computing capacity, model improvements, and dissemination infrastructure. Uh, we're increasing our support for the research to operations with the broader research community. We've had various initiatives where we have more money going out now to outside, to academic uh, um, researchers. Uh, one of the first things I did when I came in in 2013 is build it up from less than 750K to over 3 million, the C-STAR proposal arrangement. So we're, um, we're really serious about this as well. And we're looking for the next generation of students to lead the efforts to build a weather-ready nation. So with that, I thank you very much. This is Don Klein, and he's now, I think your new title is Director of the National Water Center. And that involves the entire program, uh, our entire water program, not just what goes on in that building. Well, thank you. As Louis said, I am the director of the National Water Center, and he teed up my topic pretty well. Um, I'm going to talk about transforming NOAA's water prediction services, and this is a pretty unique opportunity to talk about this, or it's, it's a pretty unique topic to talk about. We haven't done this in 30 years. Uh, usually in the government, we do things incrementally. We take small steps forward. Uh, we test a little, implement a little, test a little, implement a little. But this National Water Center that came about together with uh, the importance of water these days and the recognition of that uh, cr across the federal government, internationally, uh, in research and operations, has really kind of brought us to a nexus where it's time for a leap ahead in the science technology that we use for operational prediction. So I'm gonna talk about that a little bit, uh, uh, tell you what's behind it. I wanna start with just a little short video, if I can work my way over here which will just kind of set the stage for, for what's going on here. And then I'll tell you a little bit more in detail about some of the science and tech that we're, we're implementing right now. 
through the National Water Center. Thank you. Water. It's a life force stronger than any other on the planet. Water is vital to human health and our ecosystem. We need water to survive, to grow our food and gardens. We need water to build our city infrastructure and to generate the energy to power things. Water is a force that drives domestic We use water to move people and commerce from place to place. We use it for recreation. 97.5% Earth's water is in our oceans. Only a meager 2.5% of Earth's water is fresh water, and less than a third of that is available for human use. How do we ensure that we have enough? How do we plan for floods and droughts? The natural hydrologic system supports our lives, livelihood, and the natural environment, but also creates risk for human civilization in the form of extreme flood and drought events. That system is rapidly changing and increasingly is under stress. In the United States and globally, we face a triple threat. Population growth and economic development are stressing water supply, increasing vulnerability. A changing climate is impacting water availability and quality, increasing uncertainty. And an aging water infrastructure is forcing critical, expensive decisions. Sometimes we have too much. Sometimes we don't have enough. These extreme water risk events often come with dire consequences. Water resources in the United States are complex, with two dozen federal government agencies and countless state, regional, and local entities measuring, managing, or planning for water. But the necessary expertise and capability to address growing water challenges do not reside within one agency or organization, nor can one agency tackle these problems alone. Our society needs more integrated and comprehensive water information. The need for collaboration among water management agencies never been greater. The new National Water Center in Tuscaloosa on the campus of the University of Alabama will serve as a catalyst to address this national need. This state-of-the-art facility is designed to support collaborative water science, prediction, and decision-making. The center is a sustainable green building with LEED Gold certification. It includes a water resources forecasting operations center, an applied water resources research and development center, a proving ground for transitioning research into operations, a geointelligence facility, and an airborne snow and soil moisture observation facility. The nation's water agencies will work together at the National Water Center to create a new multidisciplinary approach to generating the environmental intelligence necessary to manage our increasingly limited water resources more effectively. For the first time, a national water program encompassing everything from research to forecasting will have a unified presence. The National Water Center in Tuscaloosa will be the nerve center for forecast operations to help build a more weather-ready and resilient nation that is prepared How is that for a blatant advertisement? And we're hiring. Okay, so Louie mentioned social science is becoming a really big part of what we're doing in NOAA, and uh, that's certainly true, and we've been looking at this now for a few years. We spent about two years talking in depth with a really broad range of stakeholders. We brought in facilitators to have these meetings. We met with sort of groups of groups, so uh, belly buttons, if you will, that represent water management, um, emergency management, the whole spectrum that we could get our hands on. Um, 
We talk with people that manage huge watersheds like the Mississippi or the Potomac. We talk with people that, that work with small watersheds that manage water for cities and for communities. And what we learned is that our mission uh, that has focused on flood prediction for really all of our history was not hitting the mark. It wasn't giving them what they needed. Uh, what stakeholder priorities indicated to us is that it's all of these things you see here. It's flooding, it's water quality, it's water availability, drought, they're worried about climate change, and your average water manager is worried about all of these at the same time. It's not sure they're worried about flooding, but they're also worried about these other things. And they want to get integrated water information, water intelligence that's actionable, uh, that's all coherent and makes sense together. So it's a broader range of hydrology, not just floods. What we heard from these interactions was that there's a high interest in very small scale information down to hill slopes, street level in many cases, small watersheds. But at the same time, there's a need for consistent information across very large scale. So some of these managers are managing huge watershed domains. They need that same small scale information in the same way everywhere throughout their domain. So some examples here beyond just floods, total water level along the nation's coast. Louie talked about um, Hurricane Sandy and the water impacts of that. So we have storm surge, but we also have inland flooding contributing to a, a higher water level than either one of them by themselves would indicate. Climate change, low flows. Philadelphia came within about two miles of sucking salt water into their freshwater intakes just a couple of years ago. And so they're contemplating a multi-billion dollar move of their freshwater system, but every mile they move it is hugely expensive. So they want to know exactly how far to move it upstream, and it'll have a 100-year lifespan. So they want to know what's going to happen in the next 100 years. Prediction uncertainty, what are the risks associated with these predictions? For the small watersheds, it's really about being relevant to the scales of decision making. If you're making a decision about how to move people in a neighborhood in a, in a flash flood, then that's the scale you need. And you may need to be worried about that over the half of the country. Consistent and coherent, this is really getting into the large watershed management realm, um, federal interests, national security interests. Uh, FEMA, for example, where we need to provide the same kind of information across the country. What this translates to is, is a realm that takes us from global. We can't predict water if we can't predict the weather. And to predict the weather, even at a point, we need global weather models to get us to that local scale. So it takes us on this continuum from global to national to regional to watershed to the street level. And then this can feed back to the global level so that what we learn about looking at street level water prediction over the next few years can inform how we handle numerical weather prediction and feed this cycle to make it all better over time. Within NOAA we have a, we, we call it total water prediction. Uh, what we mean by that is that we have the weather side of NOAA, we have hydrologic side of NOAA, we have coastal. Uh, where we deal with the coastal and estuarine and marine influences. All of these things exist. They're at different levels of scientific uh, development, uh, but they're all separated. And so what we're really trying to work on and what the National Water Center will focus on is to begin integrating these different pieces so that we get kind of a one water picture uh, across the country. So we have this summit to sea modeling array that's atmospheric, hydrologic, estuarine and marine. And that's just what's within NOAA. When we talk about our federal partners, we can go to the USGS, for example, and talk about their groundwater capabilities and others. Multi-scale, global to street level. We have models that are handling global uh, numerical weather prediction, all the way down to models that deal with water flow through streets and communities. Multi-physics, we have a wide range of models that span these scales that deal with the science in different ways and pulling that together into an integrated prediction system is really a challenge. And then we're moving towards an integrated earth system prediction where we're trying to tie this in consistently with these other dimensions like the ecological needs for water and others. So this is a vision statement for the National Water Center. The mission for the Water Center includes both operations and development. 
it's really mission-oriented research and development. We're interested in, in, in late stage or mature science, what we call technical readiness levels five through nine, and bringing those forward, maturing them, uh, and bringing them into the operational paradigm. So what we're doing with the water center is, is really starting with setting the bar pretty high. It's an ambitious goal, and I'll take you through some of that. But we're trying to set a scientific framework and a technical framework that we'll be able to hang more and more off of over the next five to 10 years. There's an operation center, which I'll describe in a little bit, a proving ground, which is really about handling this transition, a place to do that transition, kind of simulate the operational environment before you actually go there. And then there's multiple federal agencies going into this center. There's three phases that we have planned out right now. Uh, we've begun the first one, which is called Centralized Water Forecast Demonstration. And this is, Louis mentioned this, this is bringing WARF Hydro into an operational realm on our supercomputer. So that's right there a pretty big change in our, in our prediction paradigm. We typically operate on desktops or small cluster computers, and this is our first foray into supercomputing for water prediction. This involves some key building blocks, demonstrating this basic modeling capability nationally, um, and so on. Then next year, we begin development of nested, what we call nested hyper-resolution modeling. This is similar to the uh, hurricane wharf, having a nested modeling capability that can move dynamically with events, say a large uh, mesoscale, mesoscale convective system moves across the Midwest, you'll be able to move the model nest uh, with that system and look at very high resolution. You can get down to things like urban flooding and flash flooding associated with that system. And then in 17, we're looking at beginning uh, to couple with the coast, to couple with the estuarine and marine models so that we can get to that total water prediction. To begin pushing this into the next generation of our Earth system modeling capability and to begin transitioning all of this into operations through the water center. So I'll, I'll talk just a little bit here about the initial forecast framework. I won't go too far into this. Um, uh, but just to give you a sense of what this looks like, this is really a framework. So I'm not going to be talking so much about some particular models. It's more the architecture that we're using to be able to add models as we go along here. We're going to be starting with short-range numerical weather prediction uh, with the high-resolution rapid refresh, or the HER, and taking that out to medium-range and longer-range with the GFS and the CFS. Our initial prediction uh, paradigm plan for about a year from now is to go out to 30-day forecasts. And I'll, to be honest, we don't know what the scale of that's going to look like, but we're going to, that's what people want, and that's what we're going to try to deliver. This goes into Wharf Hydro, this community-based coupling architecture that links hydrologic and weather models together. And then there's a series of different types of models that we can bring into this architecture, surface water, groundwater, uh, land routing, channel routing. We can bring in the coastal and estuarine models into this framework. And then we're going to do this on what's called the NHD Plus, or National Hydrologic Data Set Plus, which I'll talk about in some detail in just a few minutes. This will have a heavy observation and data simulation component to it. Um, what this really means in terms of a transformation of our paradigm is to go from a data light paradigm where we just use temperature and precipitation to do our river forecasting today to being huge consumers of everything we can get our hands on from an observation basis, uh, in situ observations, satellite observations, and working through the processes of how to assimilate that information to constrain this model. That'll lead to national forecast guidance. Then the other piece of this which is new uh, is the geointelligence aspect of it. Right up front, we're linking all of this with national geospatial infrastructure data, uh, basically the infrastructure fabric uh, of the United States, so that we're, we're talking about, we're merging water prediction with risk and uh, vulnerability um, right up front from the get-go and providing this to our regional and local foreca forecasters. So let me talk a little bit about these three things, the Wharf Hydro, the NHG Plus, and this geospatial infrastructure. Wharf Hydro was developed by NCAR. It's community-based and supported. And again, it's an architecture to couple, couple multi-scale, multi-physics models. 
of atmosphere and hydrology. It can run at very coarse scales, uh, shown on the left here, um, tens of kilometers down to meters. There's a number of key characteristics that uh, made it attractive for what we're trying to do. It's very well linked to HydroMet data infrastructure, things like Unidata uh, and others. It already leverages the existing Earth System Modeling Enterprise, uses the standards of the SMF and so forth. It's very modular and extensible. There's community verification and model test bedding uh, set up for this. It leverages high performance computing platforms. Uh, in fact, it leverages the same computing architecture that we use in our operational supercomputer, so that makes it very convenient. And it adheres to both existing and some of the newer emerging standards related to water data, uh, as well as the modeling, the ESMF type standards. So what it's really doing is fusing the typical vertical structure of land models used in, in uh, uh, atmospheric modeling with the lateral distributed nature of hydrological models that we're familiar with as hydrologists. The NOAA and the NOAA-MP model are supported. The SAC-HGE2 is the Sacramento Soil Moisture Accounting model that was developed um, and we've used for many years in the Weather Service. Uh, it's a distributed version of that that's being linked into this. And then next year we begin the development of a new hydrological modeling core as part of this um, nested, very high resolution modeling for urban hydrology and flash flooding. These are just some of the capabilities it has, overland flow, channel flow, groundwater flow. There's, there's different packages in this uh, framework that we can select and use uh, depending on the situation. Now let me shift to the operations center and this linkage between the NHD plus, the, the basis for our water prediction, and the geointelligence. And this is how we get to what we call street level water prediction and impact-based decision support. So this is a map of major rivers of the United States and the uh, Weather Service hydrologic forecast points, the places that we make forecasts today. And at first glance, you see the rivers and you see the points, and it looks like we have uh, the situation pretty well covered. Uh, we've got forecasts along all of these major rivers, and life should be good. I'm going to zoom into this area of the Mississippi Basin. This is between Memphis and St. Louis, um, um, shown here. This is an interesting area. Um, because there's five of our regional river forecast centers that come together here, each of these RFCs, the Arkansas Basin RFC, the Missouri Basin RFC, et cetera, here, all come together, these black lines are their domains. And what you're seeing here is a little bit more, it's uh, a little bit more of the stream network that's in the NHD Plus. It's still thinned by Strahler stream order, stream order, but you're getting the idea here that there's more streams, more rivers than we're forecasting for and it by quite a bit. The other thing that's interesting here uh, from, a, from a national perspective is there's nine states in this domain, which means there's nine USGS State Water Science Center. There's also four US Cor Army Corps of Engineers divisions and six districts here. And so coordinating across all of these different organizational boundaries just within three agencies in the states um, is, is problematic. This size area, about 1,000 kilometers, is about the size of a typical convective event that could affect this entire area all at the same time. It needs that coordination. That's part of what this national center will provide. So now let me zoom in just a little bit more to an area around Springfield, Missouri. Now you can see the NHD Plus at its full resolution, all of the streams in this network. You can see that here is the one, the closest river forecast point that we have in our current paradigm. And it's about 40 or 50 kilometers south of the city. And what you're seeing here in the triangles and dots and the red pluses, these are hospitals, these are fire stations, the pink dots are EMS stations. This is part of the national infrastructure data that I was mentioning overlaying on the NHD plus. And what you can see at a glance here is that these are all affected by rivers and streams. 
and the fact that we have a forecast point 40 or 50 kilometers away isn't especially helpful to them as they're making decisions about what they need to do in the event of an emergency. Let me zoom in, zoom in to the south side of Springfield. Now you can actually see street level and you see some of these individual reaches of the NHC Plus. So here's a reach and here's a couple more, one here, one here. And now you're seeing two hospitals, two fire stations, an EMS. You're also seeing the grid resolution that we'll be running this model at. This is one kilometer, the solid lines here. The dash grid is 250 meters. We'll be running the land portion of the model, the sort of the basic hydrology at the one kilometer resolution nationally, and the surface routing component at 250 meter nationally. So at 250 meters, you're beginning to resolve what's happening to some of these reaches. And this new forecast system will be producing forecasts for all 2.7 million reaches across the United States, where today we, we forecast about 4,000 locations. So you can begin to get the idea here that in the event of flash flooding, if you're an emergency uh, responder and this is flooded, but you've got to get over here and we're providing a prediction of that three or four days in advance, if that's feasible, you begin to think about what you're going to do and how do you get over there in the event of a, a house on fire or something like that. We have this national infrastructure data across the whole country and it spans a very wide range of infrastructure. There's about 570 data layers in this database and that's one of the databases and we can talk about demographic data from uh, the Census Bureau and other things like this. This shows all the emergency services across the country. Here's the power grid, so you can imagine the water energy nexus and how that influences the power distribution, whether it's power uh, generation or it could be power taken out through floods. This is livestock across the country, all the cattle ranches and farms, the dairy cattle farms, poultry and eggs, hog and pig farms. Uh, of course, the latter being a huge influence on water quality during floods in the Midwest mobile home parks across the country. You guys have a lot of mobile home parks here. <laughs> you in Florida for some reason. But mobile homes are famous for attracting floods and tornadoes. Um, so maybe this fits into part of the prediction scheme. I don't know. So let me shift out here to the dry side. Uh, this map shows major rivers here in California. Again, our weather service forecast points overlaying on that. And then the colors that you see on the background here are just something that we threw together very quickly. It's not especially rigorous, but um, I'll, I'll call it low flow susceptibility. And all this shows is the percentage of the total annual flow that's comprised of the August flow. So basically how much surface water is there in August compared to the whole, whole year. And if you've got a lot or relatively high, you're in the blues, and if you don't have much at all, if you're below 10%, you're in the reds. So what that means is by the time you get to late summer, there's not much water in the stream system. That's all that really means. So let's uh, zoom in here just a little bit to the Central Valley, where there's a lot of red. And you can see the NHC Plus network again uh, at full resolution, and you get into the Central Valley and you see these engineered systems, the canals and ditches and so forth that span the valley to distribute water. And here's all of the agriculture, livestock, crops, every bit of it uh, that exists throughout the valley. You can see how it's focused over here on the eastern half. But now we're getting into when we talk about what streams are turning on or what streams are turning off, who's affected, what's affected, what kind of agriculture is affected, and getting very specific about that in our prediction um, realm so that we're able to understand better what we're predicting and why and who we're predicting it for. Um, if we go to the next slide here, there's not much surface water in August in this area. This is where they get it. This is all the groundwater wells in this, in this area. And as you well know, being local here, um, this is rapidly becoming a problem as this gets depleted while we continue agricultural production as though there was no drought. 
So getting this into the framework, uh, getting groundwater into this modeling framework is another priority that we're looking at after these first three and start moving forward on that maybe in 18. So today we make forecasts at about 4,000 forecast points. It's really driven by large catchment lump modeling. Uh, we do impact-based forecasting at selected points. All those forecast points I showed you have, have had somebody go out there and look at it and talk to the local community and determine what constitutes minor flooding, mi moderate flooding, major flooding. Um, but it's just at those points. What we're heading to is 2.7 million forecast locations every reach in the United States, driven by high and hyper resolution Earth system modeling with a fully integrated decision support framework for multiple socioeconomic sectors through all those different types of infrastructure by coupling to the geointelligence across the country. This is just a, a, a diagram, really, of the operation center. You saw a, a picture of it in the video. Uh, this is sort of what it looks like schematically. There's 10 desks up at the front of the, the operation center that focus on 10 different socioeconomic sectors. And basically, somebody will sit at these desks, um, initially 14 hours a day, seven days a week, eventually 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And each person, at each the people that sit at those particular desks will be experts in, in these particular sectors. So you could be an expert in the energy industry and its concerns about water, or an expert in the agricultural industry and how it's concerned about water. So you're basically translating this water picture and all this infrastructure into the language uh, of these stakeholders so that they understand what we're doing. The next set of desks, the third row back, are regional desks. They're agnostic to sectors, but focused on regional issues. So a very fundamental regional issue would be eastern water versus western water. They're very different. Um, uh, the people that sit in the eastern desk and the western desk probably won't even talk to each other. Um, so they'll be focused on those regional aspects of water. And then the back row there is really our analyst analysis and forecast production desk. This is what keeps all this running. So the observation framework, the data analysis framework, modeling and data simulation, and modeling and prediction. There's three situation rooms uh, in this center associated with all of this. So the operations center itself will focus on day-to-day -day activities, just monitoring and predicting water every day and moving on. But when we get into extended events like a flood that may go on for a few weeks or a drought that may go on for a few months, or years in some cases, we'll have space in the center to um, pull off to the side and sort of set up shop for that event. There's four organizational divisions in the water center, and all four of these divisions support the operations. So there's the research side of the National Water Center, but also the operational side, and basically everybody gets a taste of both. There's a geointelligence division, which is really about data and analytics, an interdisciplinary science and engineering division, which is our core science. We find there's a lot of people that are happy to spend their career focusing on specific aspects of hydrology, maybe soil moisture infiltration or precipitation or something like that. That's where they live. The analysis and prediction division is about integrated modeling. We tend to find it's a different kind of person who likes to pull all those things together and put them into integrated models. They'll live there. And then we have a new thing in NOAA, which kind of exemplifies how serious we are about the social sciences, the social intelligence division, which is all about human factors and the water. So that's where we're at right now. Uh, the Water Center ribbon cutting was just a week ago, two weeks ago. Um, we're uh, essentially officially open for business uh, and building all this up. It will take five or 10 years to get all these capabilities really wired up well working well, but we begin the process now, uh, have already begun it, and we begin operational production through Wharf Hydro about a year from today. So, um, and we are hiring. So thank you very much.
It looks like um, you guys aren't just worried about is it going to rain tomorrow. Um, we, you're um, identifying huge new things that you need to be doing. Where's all that money come from? I mean, there's, it's, it looks like you need people besides people looking at rainfall to be providing the resources and stuff. Yeah, so uh, our money comes from the Congress and their funding bills. Uh, this, this doesn't get made up of gold cloth and there's tremendous support on the Hill. I can tell you that um, you know, I've, I've been in this job for two uh, years, two and a quarter years, uh, two months before the sequestration hit, uh, which we uh, were taken out of. There's a tremendous uh, desire on the Hill First of all, the support the Weather Service on both sides, uh, Senate, uh, House, Republican, Democrat. Um, we're held to a high standard in terms of accountability, and that's fine. I can live with that. Uh, but the fact is uh, we're being supported tremendously, and I believe it's because uh, of two factors. Um, one, the strategic goal of building a weather-ready nation has been adopted by so many agencies and the, uh, especially the uh, regional and local emergency management community who blanket the hill for what we need to do. So in general, that's the, uh, that's the environment that I'm in uh, as the director of the Weather Service. With respect to water, uh, this has clearly uh, been recognized um, as a, an area that we have to focus on. Uh, we've gained tremendous support uh, in this process. I can tell you that even in the sequestration, we had been sequestered. Uh, one of the things I put all my senior executives to is said, okay, in the worst case scenario, what's the one thing we're going to do? I said, give me three things in priority order. Uh, and the top thing will be, uh, we'll, we'll go forward no matter what happens. The water center and the water program uh, was voted on by 33 of the senior executives, 33 out of 33 as the top priority item that we would go forward with. So uh, we're moving aggressively in this area. Uh, we've got a lot of support, uh, as I said, on the Hill, especially um, on the Senate side uh, with uh, Senator Shelby being the, the chair of our uh, Commerce, Justice, State Subcommittee, who happened to be one of the people at the Living Things Committee, um, is very interested in making this happen. And he's getting a lot of support across the, from the country as well. So I suspect um, th this money that we have in terms of spinning up this capability and uh, moving forward in hiring uh, the, the initial wave for our missile operating capability is in, it's, it's in, it's in the budget. Um, there are other agencies that have already committed now to move into that building, FEMA, uh, USGS, and we're working on the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and our next agency will be the Bureau of Reclamation, who is very big in the western third of the country. So it's being looked as a, uh, as a fusion center, and other agencies now are either getting new money or reallocating existing money uh, to make this happen. Um, you were showing a, you were showing a, the forecast for Hurricane Arthur, I guess it was, right, right. and you said that one of the models showed the correct path and several other models showed it went out to sea, is that correct? Right, so let me explain that one. The global models leading up to, uh, four, three, we run the uh, Hurricane Wharf now out to five days. Um, at that point, we were running at three and a half days. So up to about four-day forecasts, both the GFS and the European Center, which have the best track forecast in the global modeling, were all taking that storm 300 kilometers off the coast. At day three and a half, when we ran Arthur, uh, when we ran the uh, Hurricane Wharf for Arthur, uh, which uses the data like the uh, tail Doppler radar data now uh, from the hurricane hunters and other data sources, was taking that storm and running it right up along the coast with the landfall there and very consistently doing that. I just didn't pick the best model run and then the other ones all took it out to sea. But very consistently moved it right along the coast. So that's when at day three, the order went out that we're, we're closing down the Outer Banks. The 
all based on that model. And, and then the global models came into agreement in days two and one. I have to say that the European Center was the last model to come to agreement. Hey, look, when you, you, know, you finally hit one, you got to talk it up. So um, our forecasters um, you know, went into this knowing that there was a lot of uncertainty then in that track, but with the, with the solid behavior of the H4 and then the conversions of the model towards that solution, we were able to sit down with the emergency management community and really pinpoint the area for, for evacuation. You answered my question before I asked okay. it. Thank you. What the weather service does in general, and also on the water one, you had a box that says the international. Uh, what is the future of that program? I remember uh, even the officer of hydrology had a representative meeting with the international. Uh, is that going to continue or? Uh, On the water side? Uh -huh. Yes, the, um, uh, we're standing up a few other things first, but the intent is to start focusing a little bit more on the international. First with uh, the obvious ones, Canada and Mexico, where we have shared territory. Um, and shared and shared water as Canada shared, was shared reminded water. today in meeting. Um, Canada is looking at also, Environment Canada is also looking at adopting both hydro as an architecture and so we're talking a lot about how to collaborate on the development as we move forward. Um, looking at some of the Great Lakes region, for example, as a place to start that. When we start talking about beyond those borders internationally, um, it's a little bit different. I mentioned that on the weather side, we have to be able to do global weather prediction to get it right here. Right. On the water side, we don't necessarily have to do that. But as we see how well this, in this water prediction does and how much better it, it may do than what we're currently doing, for example, it may be that we want to do it internationally to improve those global weather models. And then, of course, there's a lot of um, sort of national security interests and State Department sure. interests in areas of the world where this kind of information could be quite valuable, and even Department of Commerce interests. We do a lot of water development activity in other parts of commerce that can benefit from this. So a name from the past, Kurt Barrett, for instance. I mean, he did quite a bit of that international in the Mekong. Well, we're still very active through those programs, not only through the WMO, but USAID oh, yeah. through Japan. Uh, very, very active in, in that arena. I, I would just like to point out, I think the next strategic area in which we'll wrap into a tactical area that will involve water in the cryosphere especially is the Arctic. And the Arctic prediction uh, is going to come up large and part of this 30-day prediction uh, when it's being driven by water resource management. The other part of that is the ice forecast uh, that will be demanded uh, by people operating uh, in, the, uh, in the Arctic. So that's going to be a big, uh, big deal for us and it will certainly involve the polar water uh, threat. With that, uh, okay, I'll let the last question be by my colleague from Chapman University. Thank you very much. Uh, you are doing a lot of work related to the surface water. And what I see in California, the water level is declining since 2006. Do you have any plan to calculate the vertical stress, subsidences, how the stress is going to change, how it is going to affect. So there's a couple dimensions to that. Our focus will be at first the surface water prediction part of it. Um, we're working with our partners at the USGS to move into the groundwater part of it. And we, we formed a consortium called the Integrated Water Resources Science and Services consortium, which involves the Corps of Engineers and USGS, and we're working together on a lot of these issues. So some things like subsidence will fall more into the USGS's domain, but they're working with us to get the surface water and groundwater right in the first place to begin to do that. And then we get into uh, elements of NASA with things like the GRACE satellite that can provide some information to that as well, uh, and some other dimensions. So it's a complicated situation, and as that video suggested, None of us 
can do that alone. It'll take a partnership to make that happen. Okay, that's that's uh, one of the drivers for the USGS moving. I think what they said five, five people. They have on. seven people coming. Seven in. people coming in to the water center on the front end of this uh, whole enterprise to try to get that combination on the right footing. I should note also, uh, yeah, I'm really one of the common things between space weather and um, and the water challenge and how we're moving forward. Uh, in, a terrestrial, in the history of terrestrial weather modeling, uh, the modeling started inside the government. It started um, you know, principally in the Weather Bureau. Okay. And they made it work in real time. And, it, and, and then you had the, Air, um, obviously the Air Force and the Navy was involved in that. And the, and the academic research community came in later with NCAR. They didn't have the capacity to do it. Every model that we're implementing from a space weather perspective was derived in the, not only just the research community, but the academic portion of the research community. This warp hydro has a strong component. It's clearly outside of us, has a strong academic component. The land uh, component of this is also a community model, which is run by the larger research community outside of the operational framework. It's really just the opposite of what we had in the terrestrial weather, atmospheric weather community. So I think there's a great opportunity for the research community to influence this um, at the front end. And, and through these various, you know, NCAR, UCAR, GWASI, and the like, we're managing programs through there in, in collaborative efforts. I think the academic community has a great opportunity here uh, in terms of uh, research because we're working in part like the Kwasi is uh, we're, we're, we're leveraging money that's, that's, that's coming through NSF to run a summer program that's bringing students into this water center from all over the country. So there's, there's, there are really opportunities here <coughs> that didn't really exist on the front end of when we operationalized the weather forecast. So I, I would hope that the academic folks will take advantage of that. Thank you. As you see, the audience has a lot of younger folks uh, sitting here. I mean, there's a lot of opportunities. I, if I have to say one thing about both Louis and uh, Don, both are visionaries. I mean, the whole National Weather Service's future has been transformed in the past two, three years when Louis has been in charge. Don has fought many battles to make sure that this water center it becomes a reality, and I think this is great. And Greg, you make sure that you promote all this. Okay? With that, please, on behalf of uh, Dean, Associate Dean Parior, join for the reception up there, and we can talk uh, and mingle and uh, learn a little bit more. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.